We are so amazed that in our little town of Roseburg, so many wonderful people could come out here to greet Dr. Michael Greger. Many of you know who he is, right? And some of us maybe are just hearing about him. No matter who you are, we hope this will be a really educational, fun evening where we'll get to appease our curiosity, uh, satisfy our interest in this field, this emerging field of lifestyle, lifestyle medicine. Uh, my name is John Demoff. I am the organization lead for the Blue Zones Project. I'm also the president for UC Veg. I'm so happy that we can greet you and welcome you. What we're going to do now over the next 10 minutes or so is talk to you about how this happened. How did we actually get here? What made this happen in our local area? We have some wonderful sponsors that I'm so grateful we're able to provide not only financial support, but volunteer support and organizational support. And we want to recognize those. First off, the UCC Nursing Department, a wonderful establishment, helping train local medical providers. We have quite a few UCC nursing students who are here who helped register you and have helped uh, provide volunteer resources to this. And we're really grateful for that administration, not only for this event, but for the wonderful work they're doing in helping provide medical professionals to our local area. Many of you know about Blue Zones Project. Blue Zones Project, you're gonna hear more about a little bit. And then many of you know about UC Veg, a local organization focused on lifestyle nutrition. In order to make this event happen, we had to figure out who were the people that we thought could benefit the most from this. We knew that people were interested in learning about this, but we knew that our medical professionals really uh, could take advantage of this opportunity. So just to let you know, Every medical institution that we have here locally was visited in some manner. We had provider meetings at our major clinics. There were announcements made. Mercy Hospital actually sells How Not to Die in their gift store and put postings out. There was a wonderful effort made to expose our medical community to this program. And what that means is that most likely your medical provider heard about this event. And so I'm not going to ask them to raise their hands, but I know they're out there in the audience. And I really want to congratulate you for taking the time and effort to learn something new, which is what we're all here tonight to do, learn something new. So I want to now, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a person that many of you know, who is going to explain and share with us a little bit more about the history of some of the organizations that have helped sponsor this so that we can get to know those a little more, uh, a little more closely. Please give a, a warm welcome for uh, Juliet Palencius. Good evening. Such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Based on places around the world where people are living the longest, healthiest lives, Blue Zones Project is transforming well-being across communities in North America by making the healthy choice the easy choice in the places where we spend the most time. So that video we showed a little earlier is just a brief look at what's been happening over the last few years with Blue Zones Project Umqua. UC Veg. UC Veg is Umqua Community Veg Education Group. It's a locally developed organization that's been providing cutting edge lifestyle programs to our local community for over 10 years. UC Veg has taken the recommendations from research conducted around the world, like what you're gonna hear tonight from Dr. Michael Greger, and presented it in practically applicable, simple lifestyle practices that have been integrated right here in our community. With thousands of people changing their lifestyle for the better, the miracle of di disease reversal has become the norm. Through the following projects, programs, and activities, people are able to participate with UC Veg. Weekly lifestyle and nutrition classes, known as TIP, or the Total Health Improvement Program, like you saw in the video earlier, have seen 2,600 participants and is sponsored by Umqua Health Alliance and Mercy Hospital. Yes, thank you. Monthly cooking classes, sponsored by Aviva Health. Garden builds and training for seven local schools in partnership with Blue Zones Project Umqua. 
also for low-income families and for nonprofit organizations. Monthly dinner and documentary screenings. Restaurant meetups called Dine Up, where people have the opportunity to connect while supporting restaurants that are providing healthy options in our community. Shopping tours that teach participants how to read labels, explore new healthy items, how to price compare, and how to eat healthy on a budget. Potlucks that build community and provide the opportunity to sample healthy recipes with peak attendance of 106 people. To learn more about the impact UC Veg is having in our community, go to ucveg.org. Many of you were there to register for this evening's event. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to introduce to you someone who is not only a best-selling author of the book How Not to Die, but also has founded one of the founding members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and all around a great physician who's still practicing to this day and is endeavoring night and day to travel around the country and the world to provide this information. Who profits from this? As you saw in the video, nobody's profiting from this. Nobody's making money off this event. This is for the welfare of us all. So give a... Join me in giving a warm welcome, Douglas County welcome, to Dr. Michael Greger. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Allow me to begin as uh, um, I did in that little trailer, I guess, on a personal note. This is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65. Uh, she already had so many bypass surgeries, she basically ran out of plumbing at some point, could find a wheelchair, crushing chest pain, her life was over 65. Then she saw this um, a fellow Nathan Pritikin, here's an actual picture of Pritikin. Um, and what happened next is detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people. Frances Greger, my grandmother, arrived at one of Pritikin's early sessions in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina, claudication, her condition so bad, she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. It's a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after the doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65 thanks to a healthy diet, though she was able to enjoy another 31 years on this earth till age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Years later, when Dr. Dean Norton has published his landmark lifestyle heart trial proving with something called quantitative angiography that indeed heart disease could be reversed, arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, um, uh, I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was, in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. I said, wait a second. If effectively the cure to a number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just in having a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you who are familiar with my work every year, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't have to. Very nice. <laughs> I think all the most interesting, uh, combine all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical findings, new videos and articles I upload nearly every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. There are no, everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service. 
as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. She's the reason I went into medicine and why I practice lifestyle medicine to this day. And the reason why I wrote How Not to Die, the reason why all the proceeds from all my books are all donated directly to charity. I just want to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. New videos and articles nearly every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. Where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and covered what may be one of the most important advances in health according to one of our most preeminent medical figures of the last century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that many of our major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary artery disease was almost non-existent. Say, wait a second, our number one killer almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost entirely from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in kind of modern day plant eaters. So wait a second, maybe they were just dying from early from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsy in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they're so blown away, went back to another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just a one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death. Out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand, whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, nearly all kids raised on the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks building up inside of their arteries. That's the first stage of the disease. These fatty streaks then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart, it's called a heart attack. In our brain, the same disease process causes a, can cause a stroke. So if there's anyone here this evening older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not you want to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have, whether you know it or not. But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took uh, people with heart disease, put them on the kind of diet followed by populations that do not get epidemic heart disease, their hope was, hey, maybe we could slow the disease down a little bit, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies want to be healthy all along but we're just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement on the left in blood flow to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes under the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, you know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard in a coffee table, right? You can get all red, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back, let your body work its magic. Right? Okay, but what if you whack your shin in the same place day after day, or three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> you never heal. You go to your doctor and be like, ah, oh, my shin hurts. They'd be like, no problem, whip out there pad, right, prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day, still really hurts like heck, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. 
Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It was like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can clear out all that tar and eventually, it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process started until wham, first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we could re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is just stand back, get out of the way, stop re-damaging ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. Right? Sure, I mean, the human body is a self-healing machine. Right? Sure, you can choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer. <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all? This is nothing new. American Heart Journal, 1977, cases like Mr. FW here, heart disease so bad couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. All right. Now, now, wait, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. It uh, costs thousands of dollars a year, but hey, at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> it does not look like those choosing the drug route are gonna be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and, better and cheaper, they can work better because you're treating the underlying cause of the disease. Now, normally at this point, I moved on to cancer and uh, talk about the role diet may play in preventing, arresting, or reversing each of our uh, top 15 killers. Um, but I want to take advantage of the time we have together live for uh, lots of Q&A. So I'm going to uh, just skip through uh, uh, a few of these. But, you know, in a certain sense, like what more do we need to know, right? As I noted in that video, because there's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. So anytime someone you know, tries to sell you on some new diet, do me a favor. Ask them a simple question. Well, wait a second, has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, the number one reason me and all my loved ones will die. If the answer is no, I mean, why would you even consider it? Right? If that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, shouldn't that kind of be the default done to prove it otherwise? And the fact that it can also be so effective in preventing, arresting, or reversing other leading killers type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Let me touch on those other two diseases. Diabetes, for example, we've known since the 1930s to take a small group of diabetics, put them on a plant-based diet, and uh, check in uh, um, uh, five years later, and a quarter of them were off all their insulin altogether. But, you know, plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets. Maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you have to do is put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't, uh, they don't, uh, they don't uh, lose any weight. And then we could tease out to see if there's some unique benefits to plant-based eating all beyond just, you know, all the easy weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait uh, 55 years, but here it is. Subjects were weighed every day. They started to lose weight. They may be more food. In fact, so much more food, some of the participants have problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Oh. <laughs> but eventually they adapted to so no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, I mean, was there any benefit to their diabetes? Well, insulin needs were cut 60% across the board, and half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow. How many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics 
who had diabetes as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years, and then off of all insulin in less than two weeks. Wow. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. For decades, they were just 13 days away at any time from being free. Here's participant number 15, 32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. And remember, this was with zero weight loss, right? His body just started working that much better when provided with the proper fuel. And hey, what about side effects? Oh, how about cholesterol's dropping like a rock to under 150 on average, making them effectively, you know, heart attack proof, just as like a little bonus. So just like asking our patients to make moderate changes in diet can only uh, yield modest benefits in terms of cholesterol reduction, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Everything in moderation is actually a truer statement than many people realize, right? Uh, you know, asking our diabetic patients to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, <laughs> moderate kidney failure, moderate amputate, maybe just a few toes or something. Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, there was a famous study published in a journal called Cell Metabolism, which purported to show that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy were harmful to the health of smoking, suggesting those who eat lots of meat, eggs, and dairy during middle age four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein in middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Right? Now those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. The uh, academic institution where the study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. A chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. I mean, explaining, look, quadrupling one's risk of dying from cancer, I mean, that's comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. Uh, so what was the reaction in the scientific community to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy may be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because they said, hey, uh, a smoker might think, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? So let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and dairy thing. Shh. That reminds me of a famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing your risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times, about 62% increased risk of lung cancer. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risks from secondhand smoke may be well below that of over their everyday activity. So breathe deep. That's like saying it, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot is so much worse. <laughs> How about neither? <laughs> Two risks, don't make a right. <laughs> of course, you'll know Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <clears throat> <laughs> Just saying. All right, uh, let me skip on down to high blood pressure here. 78 million Americans affected. It's about one in three American adults. And as we get older, our pressures get higher and higher such that by age 60, the majority of us have high blood pressure. So wait a second, most of us 
get hypertension when we get older. Maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural, inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Uh, blood pressure is measured of 1,000 people living in rural Kenya, typical Kenyan diet, something like this, lots of corn and beans and vegetables, fruit, greens. Our pressures go up as we age, such that by age uh, 60, most of us have high blood pressure. Their pressures go down with age, and the lower, the better. We now have evidence that even people under 120 rated may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. What? Is it even possible to get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible. It's normal for those living healthy enough lives. Two years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow. They must have had low rates of heart disease, right? Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of arterial sclerosis, our number one killer, was found. Same thing in rural China. Uh, 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70 year olds, same blood pressure, 16. Year olds. So wait a second, African diet, Asian diet, vastly different diets. What they shared in common is that they're plant based day to day with meat only even on special occasions. So wait a second, why do we think it's the plant based nature of their diet that was so protected? Because in the Western world, the only group of folks getting it down that low on average were those eating strictly plant based diets, coming in at an average of 110 over 65. This is the largest study of plant-based use to date. This is the Adventist um, uh, two study looking at 89,000 Californians comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians. Those ate meat a few times a month, but not every week. Compared to those we know meat except fish, compared to those we know meat at all, compared to those we know meat, eggs, nor dairy. And uh, this is an Adventist study, so even the non-vegetarians actually didn't eat a lot of meat compared to the general population, tend to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, not smoke, exercise a lot. It's a really healthy cohort of meat eaters. But still, we see the stepwise drop in high blood pressure rates the more and more plant-based people ate. Same thing with diabetes, same thing with obesity. Right, so sure, you can throw the vast majority of your risk out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along this spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefit. You can show this experimentally. Uh, you take vegetarians, you give them meat, and you pay them enough to eat it, their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, remove meat from their diet, their blood pressures go down within seven days. And that's after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications. They had to. I mean, you, uh, once you treat the cause, you can't be on multiple blood pressure medications with normal pressures. Your pressure will drop too low, get dangerous, dizzy, fall over, hurt yourself. Right? Lower pressures on fewer drugs within seven days. That's the power of plants. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> So, does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? No, they recommend this low-meat diet, the so-called DASH diet. You say, wait a second. When this DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? No, they, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a more plant-based diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. See, they didn't think the public could handle the truth. No, but you can see what they were thinking, though. I mean, just like drugs never work unless you actually take them. Diets don't work at all unless you actually eat them. So like, look, we can't tell everyone to eat strictly plant-based. How many people have gone and do that, right? But if we soft pedal the message, come up with some kind of compromised diet, well, well, then on a population scale, we'll do more good. A 
Okay. Tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. And the truth is that in the United States of America, most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition. As reported in the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of disease risk factors in history funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the number one cause of death in these United States, there it is, the American diet. Leading cause of disability, the American diet. Now bumping cigarettes to number two, tobacco only kills about a half million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills many more. So, if most deaths are preventable, related to nutrition, leading cause of death and disability, well then, obviously, nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school, right? Obviously, it's the number one thing your doctor talks to you about at every single visit, right? How could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let's do a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. Now, back in the 50s, the average per capita cigarette consumption, 4,000 cigarettes a year. That means that the average person walking around smoked half pack a day, on average. The media was telling people to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. <laughs> I mean, look. You want to keep fit and stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? Apples, apples do connote goodness and freshness, though, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for youth or they wanted to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, we could smoke. I mean, no curative powers claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better be safe than sorry. And smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> no woman ever says no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Sure, you know, some doctors smoked camels, but others, Preferred lucky, so there was a little disagreement there. The leader of the US Senate agreed who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Me Flint, Michigan, maybe, yeah. Don't worry though, if your throat does get a little irritated, don't worry, your doctor can always write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when the AMA is on record saying smoking on balance is good for you, not just neutral, but good for you, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the science? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, but then she smoked a camel.
Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science. That is when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. You know, if by some miracle back then there was some kind of smokingfacts.org website that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this. This is an advent study uh, published in 1958 out of California that found that non-smokers had 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first. When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored off the face of the earth, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was everywhere, in the movies, on airplanes, medical meetings where one heavy haze of smoke smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our thought experiment. You know, if you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your you know, smoking habit not so great for you. So, do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, <laughs> you could have cancer by then. Or if you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you could be dead by then. It took more than 7,000 studies in the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. All right, so you'd think maybe after the first 6,000 studies could give people a heads up or something? Powerful industry. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this came out. But as a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, I mean, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, well, we can fast forward over a half century. You know, there's a new advent of study out of California warning Americans about something else that may be putting in their mouths. Of course, it's not just one study, put all the studies together and deaths from all causes put together, many of our dreaded diseases significantly lower among those eating more plant-based. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence is just eating habits, not so good for you. So, do you change? Or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the AMA officially went on record refusing to endorse it. Why? Could it have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. Okay, so you know why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry. But why weren't more individual doctors speaking up? There were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries but that are killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary disease. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses those same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the signs, misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of cigarette smoke and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Whereas processed foods and animal foods Maybe wiping out at least 14 million people every year around the world. So those of you in this room, part of this evidence-based nutrition revolution, we're talking about 14 million lives in the balance. So maybe plant-based eating should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. Uh, 
but how long do we have to wait before the CDC says, uh, don't wait for open heart surgery before starting to eat healthier as well? Until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. You know, a few years ago when Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology, he was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends for all his patients, a strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. questions. Can we get the house lights up? How do you want to do this? All right, well, I can do it. Whatever you want to do. There we go. That was easy. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, for those who didn't hear, um, this woman from the moon, evidently, um, uh, no, uh, so uh, she uh, uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and asked her doctor about um, the, the possibility of plant-based diets reversing, curing her diabetes, and was looked at as if she came from the moon, um, and the diagnosis, you need a different doctor, that's the, but, uh, <laughs> But once you no longer have diabetes, go back to that doctor and then show them and educate them. And so, um, uh, so I mean, it, 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 one thing I would like to emphasize is that it's critically important for anyone on blood sugar lowering drugs or blood pressure lowering drugs that you must do this under physician supervision because it works so well that you rapidly become over medicated you can bottom out your blood sugars bottom out your blood pressures um, both patients and physicians alike great, greatly underestimate the power of diet to rapidly um, improve uh, um, uh, uh, blood sugar and blood pressure control um, and so that's why you need to get de-prescribed as your pressures and, and uh, sugars get lower and lower. And same thing with cholesterol medications and other medications for lifestyle diseases. Unless you treat the cause, then all you can do is slow down the rate at which you go blind and lose your kidney function, your lower limbs, but you can reverse. Now, what are the numbers on reversal? Um, uh, so for, um, for example, weight loss alone within the first eight years, 80% of diabetics um, uh, can reverse their diabetes. After eight years, it drops to about 50%, so your pancreas kind of gets burned out a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, we can still um, see remarkable benefits. And so I would encourage you to work with a physician who's schooled in, in deprescribing as opposed to prescribing. Well, we have these amazing plant-based support groups in this area, certainly. <laughs> You should be able to, so you should ask them which providers in the area are sympathetic and knowledgeable. I'm sure they can help you. Hi. Um, so my husband has had asthma for his whole life, and so we switched to a mostly, well, actually a full vegan diet for a long time. 
and he got so much better. And we were at a, um, we have a holistic doctor out of Ashland, and he was allergic to like gluten, eggs, and dairy, which obviously we're avoiding most of them, it was fine. Um, but then he retested with the IgG and IgE um, food tests, like the blood test, and it came back with him being allergic to tomatoes and lettuce and beans and corn and like everything under the sun, plus my son, my four-year-old son. So it was like nearly impossible to sustain a vegan diet um, with those allergies. And I called bull crap on him, um, but it's, you know, it's not me. I've never gotten tested for an allergy, so it's like I don't eat like I have an allergy, you know? So mm -hmm. what is your opinion on those? No, so, uh, so skin prick allergy tests are not reliable tests for allergies. Um, the what reliable tests for allergies are symptom, um, so symptoms and symptom relief. Um, so for example, so the fact that your husband's asthma improved by going on a plant-based diet, that's all the evidence you need that you're on the right diet um, is that you are controlling your asthma symptoms. This is not just subjective symptoms, but you can do objective measurements of lung function significantly improved by eating, uh, we think it's actually the fiber containing foods that are feeding your good gut back bugs um, and your microbiome and we feed them, they feed us right back with which, what are called short chain fatty acids which are absorbed from our colon, circulate through our body up into our brain um, and have anti-inflammatory effects and that's how we can decrease inflammation in our lungs and our uh, colon and why, one of the reasons why plant-based diets are so effective in controlling um, inflammatory diseases, including autoimmune um, inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, like multiple sclerosis, like rheumatoid arthritis, um, and on down the rest, list. Um, and so, um, so, I mean, uh, um, the IgG tests um, are useless. I mean, so people like I'm gluten insensitive because I had an antibody test, those are not, there's only one way to uh, definitively uh, diagnose um, uh, celiac disease, which is a gluten insensitivity, and that's with an intestinal biopsy after eating gluten, and there's, there's a whole long list of criteria you have to fit. Um, and so, uh, sounds like we need lots of new doctors in the area. <laughs> this on? Uh, first of all, thank you for what you do. So here's my issue. Meat to me has forever had a texture that has always been attractive. And I've tried to do the vegetarian, but it's always like mush to me. It just doesn't do it. Now, my question to you is the new Beyond Meat products that are plant-based, I've, I've been eating those and they give me that texture. What, what are your thoughts about these products? Yeah, so I mean, the most exciting things about these new products like Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat is basically the, uh, these are, uh, represent the incredible surge in interest in plant-based nutrition. The fact that Burger King is on TV advertising, you know, 100% Whopper, 0% beef. They're advertising their new burger has zero beef at all. That's a remarkable thing. The fact that Dunkin' Donuts and White Castle and you know, on down the list. Um, are introducing these plant-based options. That shows the tremendous surge. But of course, it also shows, uh, I mean, that, that's the kind of standard MO of the processed food industry is, you know, they'll give you any kind of junk food you want, right? You want low-fat junk food? We'll give you snack oil cookies. You want high-fat junk food? You want ketogenic junk food? You want, ironically, paleo junk food? We'll give you any kind of junk food you want but what we won't give you is real food. And why? Because real food doesn't make any money, right? Real food goes bad. Produce goes bad. It's that you can't patent it, you can't brand it. Even a broccoli grower isn't gonna get on TV, you know, uh, with an ad on TV for broccoli because you'll just buy their competitors' broccoli. Like there's no, you're never gonna see an ad on TV for sweet potatoes. I mean, it's just like on the Super Bowl. It's just not gonna happen. Um, uh, and that's just because the system is set up to, I mean, what you want is like a snack cake that lasts for weeks on the shelf. I mean, that's what you can make money off of, but, you know, good for shelf life, not so good for human life. Um, and so, it's, so, you know, it's not like the, you know, CEO of Coca-Cola is rubbing their, you know, sticky hands together, thinking about how new creative ways they can contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic. I mean, they're just trying to meet quarterly returns for their shareholders. Um, and how do you do it? You sell brown sugar water for a few bucks a bottle and you taste and it costs pennies to make because of 
taxpayer subsidized, you know, uh, artificially cheap corn syrup, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the system is just set up to give us bad food. Now, uh, these, uh, these, you know, uh, these plant-based meat products, certainly better, um, zero cholesterol, um, actually have some fiber in it, a burger with fiber, what a concept. Um, some of them are made with coconut oil though, so the same saturated fat, sometimes you even have more sodium. So, better, absolutely. I refer to them as stepping stone foods, transition foods. You know, not everyone can go kale and quinoa overnight. This is a, it's a process, and so to have those same textures and flavors that you grew up with and love, um, can help people move down that path. And I just don't want people to stall there. Um, I want people to continue to move to not just plant-based eating, but whole food plant-based eating, um, ideally. Um, and there's lots of fantastic, whole, healthy plant foods that aren't mushy. Thank you. You know, all the science in the world right, is useless unless there are people in the trenches actually putting it into practice and saving people's lives. So thank you. Fantastic. So as a nurse practitioner, as a healthcare practitioner, what can we do in the short amount of time we have with patients um, to uh, try to get them on board with eating healthier? And all you can really do is you can share resources. We have some wonderful books now, um, all available for free at your local public library, um, and wonderful websites, wonderful documentaries. How many people have seen the new Game Changers documentary, right? <laughs> Right, amazing, right? I mean, we have these wonderful resources now um, so that you can share and then they kind of go home, kind of homework and work on it and look at it on their own. There's a, a number, another great resource is uh, the uh, 21 Day Kickstart Program for, from uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, this DC-based group doing wonderful work. Starts at the first of every month, completely free. Hundreds of thousands of people have done it, done it in a bunch of different languages. You start as part of a social media group together um, and every day for 21 days you get uh, recipes and tips and, you know, inspirational, you know, and you, and you uh, share. Um, and you kind of do it together in hopes that by the end of 21 days you'll feel so much better. Your digestion is better, your sleep's better, your, your energy's improved, uh, your uh, period's less painful, migraine's better, on down the list that then you'll have that internal motivation to stick with it. So no longer is it a nurse practitioner just wagging their finger at them. It is their own body telling them, oh my God, this, I feel amazing. Um, you couldn't pay me to go back to eating that way, right? Nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the gentleman with the silver hair there and the young lady. Oh. Okay, you'll go next. You'll go next. Is there a... Now, so if there is not a video on nutritionfacts.org about a particular disease, then there's just, I mean, I mean there's two, one of two options. One, I haven't got around to it yet, and there's thousands of videos. And the other is there's just no good science yet. Um, there finally were some studies on Hashimoto's thyroiditis uh, and the effects of diet. Those videos are already scripted on their way up. I mean, the reason that I can do... Uh, go on the road and speak in 200 cities in 10 months and still not have Nutrition Facts just be a blank white screen is because I, uh, I, 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 I script an entire year's worth of videos queued up while I'm on the road. And so those are already in the bag and they're coming up, so stay tuned. 
Um, and in fact, if you want to be alerted when these new videos come out, there, should, there was an iPad going around. Where did it uh, finally reach? Oh, it's still right here? Oh, you got a while to go. Oh, here, hold on. Let me, uh, I know that's something I can do. Um, uh, and you can sign up if you're not already on my free list. I think I actually have a, a QR code that you can, if anyone has a smartphone, we can do this the fancy high-tech way. How about this? Boom, let's try this. Ta-da! Okay, nope, that's the evidence-based guide. That's good, too. Actually, a nice free resource, but there we go. Um, so if you point your phone at the screen, something magical should happen. It should open up this link, and then you can sign up. I do have an iPad going around the room, but it looks like it's only about a third of the way through. And so if you're in the back, you haven't signed up yet. If you already signed up on the iPad, don't worry about this. But... Oh, that's cool. It looks like a rock concert with, like, lights in the... <laughs> there we go. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, hopefully that'll work if I don't get to you in the back. All right. All right, we got a question right here. Yes, with the hat and the hand, black, black turtleneck. That is a fantastic question. The question was, for those who didn't hear it, what about the impact of diet on immune function and not autoimmunity, but actually bolstering our immune competence, the ability of our immune system to fight off cancer and to fight off infectious disease? I mean, if a uh, plant-based diet is so good against autoimmune diseases, so anti-inflammatory, I mean, inflammation is part of the immune system. So is all these plants tamping down your immune system? It turns out we actually get the best of both worlds. It tamps down the inflammatory part of the immune system, the smoldering inflammation that underlies so many of our chronic diseases, but at the same time boosts um, our, uh, our, um, uh, the cancer and disease-fighting parts of our immune system. So, for example, simple interventions like eating blueberries. You can randomize people to eat blueberries or not. See significant improvement in natural killer cell activity, which are the uh, cells, of the immune cells that go through our body and, and pick off uh, budding cancer tumors and kill off virus-infected cells. Um, uh, white button mushrooms, plain white, simple, cheap, convenient white mushrooms, um, showed significantly decrease uh, upper respiratory tract infections in children. Um, it's, it is the season, this is a good time to be eating mushrooms. Um, uh, and so there's specific foods um, as well as uh, dietary patterns. And all you have to do is type in immune into nutritionfacts.org and all those videos will pop up. Let's take someone from the back. Okay, I see a hand waving back here. Gentlemen with the glasses, yes. Cheap seats in the back. with lifestyle medicine, right? You can swap patients and show them what's possible with someone they've known for decades and all of a sudden they have these miraculous recoveries. It doesn't take many to, uh, to you know, change people's entire, uh, you know, uh, thinking about uh, medicine. You know, these days, it's very frustrating practicing prim uh, primary care. About 80% of what comes into the primary care office these days is these chronic lifestyle diseases, which unless we treat the cause, will continue to get worse, 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 and then they die. Um, uh, I mean, you know, the only happy doctors these days are like obstetricians, give, you know, uh, uh, delivering babies. I mean, everybody else, I mean, but why did we go into medicine? We went into medicine 
I mean, if you want to make money and go to the stock market or something, we went into medicine because we wanted to help people, right? We wanted to take care of sick people, yet we graduated without this powerful tool in our medical toolbox. But once we realized, wow, we can actually, you know, lay hands, kind of people jumping out of wheelchairs, people actually getting better, I mean, that's, uh, and, I mean that's, that can reignite that, that idealistic spark that drove us all into the field. Um, and really um, be quite satisfying. And you know, so when you go to these, uh, you know, plant-based nutrition healthcare conferences, the American Cause of Lifestyle Medicine conference, thousands of plant-based practitioners all came around typically because an actual patient educated them. A patient read the China study, watched forks over knives or what the health or whatever, and ch changed their diet, went to their doctor, had this miraculous recovery. Um, and that, and the doctors think in the back of their minds, I've got 2,000 patients just like you. Um, and, uh, and can sometimes change their entire practice um, a model around. And so uh, absolutely, we need to share these stories. Of course, me, in the background, I'm you know, banging my head against the wall saying, wait a second, you're changing your practice over an anecdote? I've got a mountain of evidence this high. We've had it for decades, hello. Published in the most prestigious medical journals in the world. But something about that you know, person in front of you and seeing it with your own eyes can really have an important impact. So I think that's a, that's a great thing we can do. Yep, uh, Crystal's husband. Go ahead. <laughs> That's right, he's Crystal's husband. <laughs> What's the impact of plant-based diet on Alzheimer's? Oh, what a question. Well, you know, Dr. Dean Ornish, um, July 21st, uh, 1990, published in The Lancet, the, the Lifestyle Heart Trial, proven for the first time um, that we can reverse heart disease, number one killer of men and women with a whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle program. And so having conquered killer number one, he moved on to killer number two and took a group of uh, men with early stage prostate cancer, put them on the same diet that reversed heart disease and for the first time ever showed a dietary intervention reversing the progression of cancer. So in the um, dietary group, uh, the tumors on average shrunk, whereas in the control group where patients were just told to follow whatever advi dietary advice their doctors had for them, the cancers continue to grow as cancer tends to do. That is the only diet ever proven to do such a thing um, to date. So he was like, all right, how about killer number four, Alzheimer's. Four million Americans affected now our fourth leading cause of death. And so Dr. Dean Ornish, right now, as we speak, has a randomized controlled trial in which Alzheimer's patients were randomized to the same plant-based um, uh, diet and lifestyle program in hopes that we can reverse Alzheimer's disease. Now that takes some chutzpah. Um, and uh, we have no idea. The results haven't been released yet because um, the, uh, the study isn't even completed. But once it does, I will do a video about it, so make sure you sign up. We really appreciate our sponsors for making this happen tonight. Thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a great night, everyone. So how did you hear about Blue Zone Project? Well, I'm a family physician down in Brookings, and I've been uh, espousing this uh, whole food plant-based uh, diet for a few years for my patients. And you know, we know that, like Michael says, the top 15 causes of death are directly contributed, uh, def definitely and basically due to the standard American diet, which I love is abbreviated SAD. Or maybe the modern American diet, which is abbreviated MAD. So you have to be mad and sad to eat what you know, we've been eating all these years. But, you know, it's an uphill fight because, you know, from the day you're born, you're indoctrinated by your parents unwittingly, agribusiness, the food industry, advertising, that we, you know, we're meant to eat animal products and fast foods and processed foods, and well, it turns out they're no good for you. you know. Who knew though, right? But now we know, right? Now we have the nutrition science that says, hey, this is bad. And, um, but it's, you know, you can only, you, we try, I try to change one person at a time, you know, it's, you know. So medical guidelines are always, this is better than what we were doing, but it ends up being like a C minus average. So if you want to get an A, and if you want something optimal and healthiest, you know, a whole food plant-based diet, low fat, of course, you know, SOS free, I mean, that's where you want to go, you know, but 
it's just hard to convince people. been a part of Blue Zone? Two years. Last two years? Two years ago, a representative came and gave a little talk about committing to some health improvement at uh, the extension office. And I signed up to walk 10,000 steps every day, and I've done it for two years. That is awesome. Wow. What other parts of Blue Zone have you been a part of, not just the... Uh, UC Veg tip class. It's wonderful. And I feel so good. Have you seen any medical changes, any numbers that have been altered? Oh yeah, I lost probably 20, 25 pounds. 